So Sharon, I wanted to talk to you about your poem, The Fire. I think we're going to put that in the Cascadian Zen volume, number one. Number two, you read it at Cascadian Tacoma. You're going to need to unmute yourself so that we can hear, um, hear any response you might have to this. But you read it sort of in solidarity. I don't know. Maybe you were planning to read it, but you know, Ianthe Brodigan, Richard Brodigan's daughter uh, came and we were honoring Richard Brodigan at that fest. C.A. Conrad was there, uh, Patricia Smith and uh, other poets. And um, as I go back to it and I, and I read, you know, that section that I read to introduce you, I feel like a real prophecy. I don't know, maybe it's easy to say that the planet's getting warmer and there's gonna be more fires, but it feels really prophetic to me to, uh, to go back to that and read the poem and the other poems in the book, which refer to fire. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to the prophetic in your work and in poetry? Oh God. <laughs> well, Do you think you get there? Th you get there through spontaneous? Do you get through through projective verse? Is that one way to get there? How, how do you think that it that the poet can enter those realms? Well, uh, I guess a projective by by the very nature of of what it does uh is is prophetic and that doesn't mean that the poet understands or can foretell or knows the future but that um you um there's there's an undercurrent that i think poetic imagination poetic language can can um articulate and and because that undercurrent is not actually just basically linguistic, it's also rhythmic. That that the that language is kind of attracted to certain uh, rhythms. And and um, my particular the fire poem that I that I wrote was is very condensed, um, not deliberately condensed, but I was still kind of in shock when I wrote it, mm -hmm. and so um, I was really uh um you know kind of squashed and dry <laughs> kind of you know and shocked and uh and that's where that and that's where that particular lineation or that the rhythm of that poem comes from but um during the event during the fire itself we i was so completely naive about what was going on i had no idea we had you know, uh, embers falling and sort of burning the, the lawn furniture and stuff. And I was like, gee, you know, like uh, maybe we should get out of here. And the fact was that we were not evacuated until the very last minute the fire was just coming down the hill. Mm. Wow. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, it, for several weeks, we didn't even know if our house was still standing and that kind, kind of, uh, it, it, it was so freeing um, to imagine at that point to think, oh, my house is gone, you know, uh, wow, what do we do now? And it felt like uh, uh, an open page, an open sh sort of sheet of possibility and and also you knew the shock that would be coming but for that particular time it was a uh it it was um it wasn't really shocking at all it was it was um the sense of belonging to a larger catastrophe uh because we already knew about 300 houses that had burned down already so it was like okay this is what has happened this this and so maybe um you know it's you think of the prophetic as as maybe connected to kind of foretelling or foreseeing or um picking up on catastrophe but it isn't entirely that it's how are you going to live how are you going to be how are you what are you going to think who who are you going to be in this in this world that is um is being formed out of these floods and fires and and infrastructure decisions and everything else so i think just you know i think well if being poetry when you're uh, this poet i'm uh, 
poetic imagination to me is the greatest knowledge, the greatest knowledge source. Um, and to whatever degree knowledge is involved with prophecy or poetry is, it's because of the unknown, the unseen rhythm of, um, somebody mentioned earlier animism um, that, that is always with us. And um, no, I mean, it's, uh, we're, we are living in times that are uh, really stretching our um, capacities for, for compassion and mm -hmm. um, for um, our own kind of behavior, um, all kinds of things. It's uh, uh, our, our uh, appearing uh, on the horizons of our thinking. And, and I think, I, I, I feel really honored to be in the presence of Daphne and Brenda and John and Paul and all of you here as people who can uh, realize at that heart level that it is with, you know, with, with the, the uh, companionship within poetic mm -hmm. thinking that, that we can keep each other company. And I, and I think that's what Paul helps to arrange for us over and over again with, with, his, um, with his work with the uh, Cascadia Poetics Lab, and I'm very honored uh, mm -hmm. to be included in the company of these wonderful people, and and those of you who who um, contributed and who are here tonight, listening to us and participating, being with. Us. That was beautifully said, Sharon. Thank you. It was beautifully said about the poetic imagination. It's not just imagination. No. It's something, it's something to do with what is unsaid in the said, mm -hmm. which poetry is always trying to reach, mm -hmm. trying to convey, I should say, uh, without naming it always. Just, it's there in the gaps, in the silences too. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm.